And it's in John 14. It's in John 15. It's in John 16. It's all about it in John 17. And so, in many places, is this contrast between God and Father. So now in the timeline of Jesus' life, this is the first proclamation that he makes after the resurrection. And look at it. Saying these things, this is Mary Magdalene, she turned back around to, and sees Jesus standing there. And this is, you know, on Easter morning, she's at the tomb, it's open. She's distraught because she thinks that they've taken him away. She sees Jesus, thinks he's the gardener. Jesus says to her, Madam, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? And she, thinking that he is the gardener, says to him, My Lord, if you have carried him off, tell me where you put him and I will take him away. And then Jesus says to her, Mary. In turning, she says to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then I don't understand this next thing. Jesus says to her, Do not cling to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them. Now, I don't understand what that means. You know, and I could ask the Lord and probably sit around for a couple of days and get some highlight or something. But I do understand the next thing. I understand what he says to her next. He says, go to my brothers and tell them, I ascend to my father and theirs. your Father, and to my God, and your God. You understand the emphasis of this first declaration? Oh, my God? Yes. My Father? Yes. Did these guys have it all right theologically? No, no. Forty days later, they're standing there saying, hey, is now the time you're going to give the kingdom back to Jerusalem. <laughs> no. It's not predicated on what we do. Our experience of it in a large part is it's predicated on what he did when he said it's finished. It's predicated on what he did when the grave could not hold him and corruption could not lay hold of him. And it's predicated on the reality of this declaration. Go and tell them I am ascending. Okay, that would have been news to my father. Earlier, remember, he, he warned him of that in John 14, 15. He said, you know, I say I'm going back and you're all sad, but if you knew who the father was, you'd know this was a good thing. And when I go back, I'm going to be able to send the comforter. I can't send him yet because I haven't ascended, but I'm going to. Anyhow, but do you see this parallel? Do you see the significance of this parallel? Can I, can I do anything... <laughs> to make it more life-giving. Jesus, his disciples, keep in mind, were hiding. Peter was still struggling with shame. Paul later reveals that he first appeared to Peter before the rest of the disciples. So that means between when he said this and when he appeared in the room after the guys on the road to Emmaus, somehow he had gotten to Peter, according to Paul. And Paul said, look, I, uh, they, they didn't tell me this. I got this by revelation. So before Peter had been lovingly rescued in his heart from the bitterness that he walked away from crucifixion night with, and before doubting Thomas had his doubts overcome, and before any of that happened, Jesus made the unqualified declaration in association with the event that was the pivot point of history. Not just his death on the cross, his return to the Father. I am ascending to my Father. Now, he didn't say, my God first. <laughs> he said, my Father. But he did say, my God, because that definition of God that seems so sterile and distant, it's okay, but it's not the whole picture. It's not the whole picture. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God, to your God. In this phrase, Jesus was defining 
the two-part reality and relationship that humanity has with God because of him. And we've got to explore that more. We can't write this off to just a transactional thing like we punched the ticket. We have to explore it more. Okay. If that doesn't show you enough that the, from the very first proclamation in the scripture about I need to be in my father's house, about my father's business, to the last thing he said after he said it is finished, Father, 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 the victory statement. That's the victory statement. Because sin tried to convince him, tried to demand that he break that relationship, and he didn't, and he couldn't. And now he's sitting here introducing the whole of the new resurrection life and power, the victory over principalities and powers and aeons and all that kind of stuff. He's, he's, he's announcing that right here in the context of my father and your father, my God and your God. Oh, something big there. But just so you know that he has maintained his focus. The last official act that is recorded of Jesus in eternity is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Right? It's the last thing. Do we know record of There's probably stuff that goes on after that, but we have no record of that in Scripture. And that, this that's being talked about, leaves whatever history may be revealed in Revelation in the, in the dust, in the back. Because this is, this is the day that Peter spoke about, that he must remain in heaven until the restoration of all things. Then the full completion. This is it. What is Jesus' focus? When he delivers the kingdom to him who is God, the supreme being and Father. This is why I, I am comfortable with this massive shift in my own understanding and my own habit. And I want you to consider being that way. Because if we had a record of what Jesus saw and thought about when his eyes opened up, uh, maybe he was able to distinguish the angel song and it was talking about what his father had just done by giving goodwill and hope to men. But we know for sure that the first words expressed by him at 12 years old were about his father. The last thing expressed by him on the cross was about his father. The first declaration he made was that just off the charts, amazing, powerful declaration about the equality of his relationship with his father and our relationship with his father and his God and our God. And then the very, very last thing he does is this. When he renders every principality and every authority and power ineffectual, for he must reign till he puts all enemies under his feet. The last enemy rendered ineffectual is death, for he subordinated all things beneath his feet. But when it says all things have been subordinated beneath his feet, it's clear that this does not include the one who subordinated all things to him. That would be the Father. And when all things have been subordinated to him, then will the Son himself also be subordinated to the one who has subordinated all things to him. Who is that? God. But Jesus knows that God as him who is the God and Father, so that God may be all in all. So Jesus' focus, all I want to say, all I'm trying to say about this particular thing, is that Jesus' focus on God was the one constant from his birth to his death to his resurrection to his ruling and reigning in a culmination of the ages. Jesus came to reveal and honor the Father. Which now doesn't seem so weird theologically and cultish or something, thinking that we were conceived as humanity between the dialogue between the, the, the thinking of the Logos and the Father. We were conceived of that. 
And then when the decision was made, it says that he was made. Everything was made through him. And even prophetically, it's announced. Let me read this to you prophetically. I've got to shut up. I'm getting too long. This is one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. I, I really got excited when I thought it was a part of the New Covenant, and I think it is. But this is even more exciting. Listen to this. Isaiah 9, beginning in verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called. Listen to these names. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over the kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now, I don't know who that's referring to. I could probably ask somebody in here or figure it out. Whether the Lord of hosts would be referring to Jesus, would be referring to God, or would be referring to Yahweh Elohim, which is the Father, Son, and the dynamic of the Holy Spirit. But the point is, Isaiah 9, 6 and down does a sweeping embrace of this whole purpose. And it tells us that odd and mysterious thing that the child born and the son given is going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And here's the key for us. And this is why... This is why your, your embrace of your childness is so, so important. Because only a child will consistently be able to answer the question, who is God, properly. Otherwise, we'll drift over and substitute the rational thought of him being the source of moral goodness. He is. We'll drift over into him being the creator and sustainer of all. And he is. But those things are a subset that flow from his heart as a father and the dynamic of the relationship between the father and the son in the spirit. And think about Paul saying, you know, he who doesn't have a spirit doesn't have the life. But you have a spirit, you have the life. What life do you have? You have the life between the Father and the Son. You have that life. Not some independent thing that we have to, like paupers, scratch out. Or not some zero-sum balance where Jesus has a gallon of life and we all have enough, if there's eight billion people, to have one eight billionth of a drop of it. No. It is his life. And that's why if we get this, then that's why Jesus could say something as silly in the face of how hard life is and how hard discipleship is. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to the sycamore tree, be cast up and cast into the sea. No, it'll happen. For nothing is impossible. Because Jesus could say that. And that's what he shared with us. Not us trying to imitate that. Us trying to live in that, to receive it, and to, and, and to realize that we're in a process. Those that, he came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. But as many as did receive him, those that believe on his name, he gave them the power to become. You're becoming, I'm becoming. The poor ignorant guy and gal out there that don't know it yet, they're just ready to become. And what will it take? It'll take receiving. And how do they receive? Well, they'll see him. They'll know. We'll tell them. Something will happen. I can't go on tonight, but I can help understand and, and, and prove this contrast. For instance, there's all kinds of things you can know about God. Romans says that you can know about his essence. You can know about his nature. In the frame of God, that definition there of the supreme being, you can see him in the sunsets. You can see him in the sunrise, but you can't know him as father. You know him in Father through Jesus. Then you begin to see him as Father in the sunrise. Everywhere. But, but Jesus is the key. 
Um, I'll close with just a little thing I, if I can find it. Yeah. Uh, so I was asking the Lord, Lord, if I keep preaching about this childness thing the way I understand it right now, this was a couple days ago, if I do that, then the people that love me are going to roll their eyes and get bored silly. Because there's about eight or nine references to a child, and I can't just keep harping on these things forever, so what's the point? Now, now I wasn't saying that disrespectfully, because I believe this is the most important revelation of Christian reality and life and God that I've ever had in my entire life. And I know I'm just scratching the surface on it, and I would give the rest of my life to be able to unpack it. But this is what the Lord said. He said, your key is not only seeing yourself and helping others to see themselves as my children, but also seeing me as your father. Because it is how Jesus knows me. And your opportunity is to know me with his knowing. And then he said, man, man knows all about me as God. Even much of the things that, that I'm not. <laughs> I felt like he was laughing. My son gave you the knowledge of me as his father and as your father. That is what you are helping my children to see. The ways and the places that your, quote, knowledge of me as God has crowded out knowing me as father and Abba and Papa and Daddy. To know me, your God, and I am your God, the only eternal God, as Father, is your eternal life. And I know, I, I thought immediately about what Jesus said there at the beginning of, of John chapter 17. 17.1 17 starts with Father. And it goes down, and he says, this is eternal life, that they would know you. Who's he talking about? He's talking about his Father. But then he goes, the only true God. So it's not a com competition between fatherhood and godhood. Godhood is a philosophic, theological statement that closely matches a definition like that. And it also begs us to come up with nearly meaningless theological axioms to describe them. And it causes us to sit at a distance in a student or a professor or a judge's chair and say, well, he's transcendent or he's not transcendent. He's uh, omniscient or he's omnipotent. If there were ever words that meant nothing in the relationship of a child with his daddy, those are the words. But that's what we're tempted to reduce our relationship to God with. And I love theology. And those things have now all kinds of impact on my heart if I'm thinking about God as a father and relating to him as, as the way Jesus was. You know, then Jesus can say, um, don't, don't pray with vain repetitions because your father already knows what you need before you ask. Pray this way. Our father. I thought, I thought that the big revelation out of that for me about three weeks ago was that we didn't need to think of ourselves as just isolated individuals. But our father, mine and Bev's, mine and Nancy's, mine and Richard's, mine and Jen's, that added a kind of strength and stability to this. But when I got to the thing where, and in, when I got to the part where Jesus told Mary to go tell the disciples, your father and my father, that's not just me and Bev and Jen and Richard in this group, it's Jesus in this group. That is the magnitude and the importance of us understanding our childness as our most basic identity. It'll open the door to avoid the distraction that puts God out at a theological distance and embraces him as our father. And that will never be over until possibly that very last thing then I can't imagine that he, he's going to easily surrender fatherhood because it's part of his heart from before creation. So. So thanks again to Paul, who's up there, I think, yeah, uh, for, for giving us some examples of contemplation. And I just would 
commission all of us to spend some time identifying with Jesus and contemplating him who is God our Father. I think it'll change us, guys. I think it will change us. I do. So, let me pray. Holy Spirit, one of the simple descriptions of your job, and I mean no disrespect speaking to the God of the universe by narrowing it down to a job, but it's, it's the commission that Jesus explained to us when he said that uh, you were going to take what the Father has given to Jesus and announce it to us. And then Jesus I have to believe he was smiling when he did this. He says, oh yeah, and by the way, everything the Father has, he's given. That means that everything the Father has given Jesus, you are called and sent to announce to us. And so before we can apprehend that in any measure, we want to say thank you. Thank you for giving us all the love that the Father has for Jesus, that he loves him with. Thank you for giving us all the authority and all the power, but not independent of a Father's care, one who provides protection and provides cover and purpose. Thank you for fathering us, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for taking up the role of the Father's fathering of us. Thank you for making Jesus live in our heart, Holy Spirit. Thank you for helping us have the confidence to engage in the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love and honor for the Father. And Lord, I'm talking way over my head. I I barely know the teeniest part of this, but I know it's real. I know you're revealing it. And I know it's the answer to a lot of the lostness and the anger and the, and the brokenness in the lives of people. And I know if we can ever get our gospel crafted in such a way and begin to speak it and share it in such a way that we don't distract the people by making them inventory their sin or something like that. But we just speak to them in a way that that inner voice, your inner voice, Holy Spirit, can bear witness and say, Abba. Cry Abba. Cry Abba. Just just speak it out. Cry Daddy. So Lord, the best that we can offer right now is to believe and to receive. The best that we can offer right now is to contemplate this, to think about it as we go from here tonight. And I just believe, Father, and I pray for every person in this room and every person on Zoom. And then one generation beyond that, I pray for every person that we have a conversation with this week about this concept, about the love and life and relationship of Jesus being given to us and us being drawn into it. And now our job is to understand or live it out or experience it or something. I just pray that you're witness your amen will be on that as we contemplate it think about it I pray Father that it find a way into the practical areas of our life areas of prayer intercession warfare standing witnessing giving praying for the sick it is the root of everything help us to engage it in Jesus.